Could the Vikings have used Chinese swords? Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. So this is one of those what if videos. The basic fact here is that as far as we know, the Vikings, or um, we could say the Norse, of the, let's say, 7th to 11th centuries didn't make use of Chinese swords, as far as we know. But obviously we're reliant on the archaeological record um, and written sources to some degree, but primarily the archaeological record, that is, things buried with people. And as far as we know, the um, Vikings of, of, the, of that period, of the Viking era, could technically have used Chinese swords of the same period. So this is a Tang Dynasty uh, replica by um, LK Chen and they could have acquired these swords and they could have used them but as far as we know they didn't do that. The question is uh, first of all how could they have got those swords? Secondly why might they have wanted to use them? And thirdly why didn't they use them? So first of all how could they have acquired, acquired those swords? Well I'm sure many of you know that the Vikings were part of extensive trade and conquest um, routes all over Europe and uh, beyond. Now of course there are several routes in which Chinese objects could and did make their way into Scandinavia and not just Scandinavia of course but other areas where the Norse were active and that includes northern France, that includes the Byzantine Empire, that includes what we now know as Russia um, and places like uh, Ukraine and all over. So um, the, obviously the Viking trade networks were huge and in fact not only could things get from places like China all the way to uh, Scandinavia, but they did. Uh, and we actually know, uh, we have examples from archaeology of things which are from the Far East, which have been found in, in situ in archaeological sites and also um, in burials in some cases, which definitely come from, uh, for, from the Far East of Asia. And now the two main obvious routes, there are other possibilities, but the two main obvious routes that things would have got into the Viking controlled lands uh, from China would have been through the, the north essentially, what's now, uh, what's now Russia trading uh, across what would uh, later become the, the kind of Silk, Ro Silk Route, uh, Silk Road, uh, but also down the rivers um, in, in Russia as well. Uh, but additionally through the southern route, so th sort of through the Byzantine connection as well. And, and of course the Vikings were very active down in southern Europe as well as up in northern Europe and in Eastern Europe. So in fact there are two kind of obvious ways that um, Chinese goods could have found their way into Viking hands but there are many other ways as well. We have to remember of course that the uh, Vikings were raiding and um, inhabiting in some cases settling in places like England and uh, what became France, um, bits of Germany. So uh, and obviously down in uh, around the um, Iberian coast and even uh, to North Africa to some degree as well. So the fact is that there are numerous ways in which Chinese goods could have got to other places and then from those other places got into Viking lands, be it Scandinavia or where, wherever else, Normandy, wherever else they were inhabiting at the time. So the fact is that I think we can definitely say that it would be possible in say the 8th or 9th century for a Chinese uh, Tang Dynasty sword to end up in uh, Viking hands. So we've established they could definitely end up with a Chinese sword, but would they use it? And is there any evidence for them using Chinese weapons? Well, no, basically. There is absolutely no evidence that I have ever seen for any Chinese weapons ending up in Viking lands, or at least not staying in uh, in one complete um, part, shall we say. And I think there we've got a bit of a clue. So I think it's possible that steel, uh, in the form of perhaps swords or other weapons, did find its way into uh, Viking held lands in this period. And in fact, we've got a very good piece of evidence of this in the uh, manifest form of the Ulfbert swords. Now, you will have maybe heard about Ulfbert swords. If you heard about Ulfbert swords, you probably heard lots of different things about them. The basic fact is that they seem to have been made of crucible steel, which probably originated in India. However, we don't know precisely how it got from India to uh, the Viking lands. We don't know whether it was traded as a raw material or 
and this is very possible, whether it actually came in the form of blades made for other purposes. So perhaps blades made, made elsewhere, which were then reforged into the uh, blades that we see in the Ulfbert swords. We just don't really know. Now, I don't know about the metallurgy and whether there are ways of telling whether these uh, swords are made from uh, freshly made crucible steel ingots or pieces of metal, or whether they are crucible steel that could have been previously in a, in a form of a blade that has been remade into a new shape of blade. I don't know the answer to that question, and I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that question. I don't even know if anyone's asked that question before, so I think it'd be a very interesting uh, uh, avenue of, of research to go down. But the fact is that um, in China at this time we've actually got, we don't have crucible steel blades, we have laminate steel blades um, that have differential um, heat treating, basically quite similar to Japanese swords. Okay, so the swords in China at this time are in many, many ways a precursor to Japanese swords of a couple of centuries later. And in fact, if we look at Japanese swords from this period, from say around 800, uh, then we actually see that they are materially very, very similar to Chinese swords of the same period. And in fact, this particular replica that I've got here from LK Chen is based on uh, or is inspired by an example in Japanese uh, collections, although it's a Chinese sword in a Japanese collection. So, uh, and, and we actually have a unique survival of early Chinese swords in Japan because they were seen as high status items. They were brought in uh, to Japan and they were kept in um, shrines and, and, and all sorts of uh, sometimes private collections as well. So this is a Chinese sword but it is inextricably connected to Japanese early Japanese swords as well and it's, it has a similar form of manufacture to it. Now uh, this type of steel could, uh, could have found its way into uh, Scandinavia where it could have been reforged, it could have been included in a pattern welded blade even, uh, but the, the steel could have been recycled, could have been reused. So just because we don't have any surviving evidence of Chinese specifically swords in Scandinavia or Viking held lands at this time doesn't mean that they never made their way there. First of all, there's the survival bias. It's possible that some Viking somewhere uh, at that time had a Chinese sword, but it just hasn't survived to us and no record has survived to it because of course the swords that survive are a tiny, tiny percentage of the number of swords that were ever made and used and carried. Um, so it's First of all, that's possible. And secondly, it's possible that a Chinese sword or other similar weapon could have made its way into Viking lands or into Viking hands and then been recycled into a Viking style weapon. Now, the next interesting question is, when we look at Viking uh, weapons and equipment, the question would be, why would a Viking, say in the uh, 8th to 10th century, not want to use a Chinese sword in its unadulterated and unaltered form, as far as we know. Why did they want their sword to be like this, and they did not want their sword to be like this? Well, <laughs> that is an interesting question, and that's obviously more into my realm um, of sort of sword using and sword usability. There are some major differences between the Chinese sword and the Viking sword. Um, the first is in their obvious appearances and proportions. So the Chinese sword, as you'll see, is considerably narrower, uh, but it is actually thicker, okay? So it's more similar in proportions to a Japanese sword um, of this period. In fact, for this period, it's basically the same as, or almost the same as a Japanese sword, um, but it is narrower and thicker. So it's different proportions. The uh, famous Type 10 blade that we see in the Viking era, and remember not only used by the Vikings but also by the Franks, this is actually a replica of a Frankish sword, um, and the Anglo-Saxons and Germans and um, Longobards and various other people. Um, so this has a famous sort of shape and outline. It is a broad and fairly spatulate tipped um, cleaving chopping sword, okay? And this very, uh, with a very short grip, um, and it's also got this characteristic uh, capital I shaped or H shaped um, grip. 
which uh, we've talked about a lot in previous videos, which combines very, very well with a system of sword and shield fighting and has enormous cleaving power. The other thing which is quite characteristic, certainly about the earlier Viking era swords, if not the later Viking era swords, is that they balance fairly far out from the hand. Okay, So combined with the fact that you've got a relatively large amount of the total mass distributed towards the tip. You've also got a point of balance fairly far from the hand and you don't have a lot of counterbalance. So these are very powerful cleaving swords. They are not uh, very nimble in the tip or anything like that and they're not really designed for thrusting through stuff except for flesh. Uh, you're not going to get through very much um, uh, sort of armour, for example mail armour of the day uh, or anything like lamella or anything like that with that type of tip or at least not very easily. You're going to have to thrust at gaps. Um, so these are swords that are designed to give very fearsome blows. In comparison, the Chinese sword of the day is actually really very, very uh, nimble. Now this particular type of Dao was actually um, of the Tang Dynasty, so it's a Tang uh, Heng Dao, was um, used by all types of soldiers from the conscripts uh, right the way up to the commanders. This was a pretty much universal type uh, design of Dao that was carried by all military classes, obviously made to different qualities and different decorative grades depending on your social status. There were mass produced ones and then there were custom made ones of course, but the basic overall shape and design and characteristics of this weapon was universal across the um, military structure. Now this type of sword I would say is more versatile, um, and I'll explain that point in a second, than the Viking era sword. The Viking era sword to me is quite a specialised kind of sword. It doesn't work very well without a shield, um, and it's very clearly optimised for cleaving. It is a very powerful cleaving sword. This sword in comparison feels really quite similar to later European sabres. It is a cut and thrust sword, it's quite nimble, it's relatively short, it's about 27-28 inches usually, which is not dissimilar to the Viking era sword. They tend to be a little bit longer, but remember there's a physical stature difference here as well. Europeans tend to be a bit taller than uh, Chinese and Japanese people, uh, at least in that era. Um, but, uh, but stature aside, it could just simply be that they preferred slightly shorter blades for some reason, um, which do have some advantages certainly in sort of battlefield combat situations where sometimes a shorter blade is easier to manoeuvre around than a longer blade, certainly if you're using shields, famously of course the Romans using their gladius. Um, so this is a very different handling sword, it's much lighter and more nimble and it, it does have a fairly good counterbalance. The point of balance is fairly close to the hand, it's actually a fair way out as well, it's not particularly close to the hand, but it feels quite nimble because of the mass distribution. It's got quite a lot of distal taper, it's much thicker at the base than it is down here, and it's a relatively narrow blade, and you do have that elongated hilt, which you could grip with two hands and use like a Japanese uh, two-handed sword, although I think predominantly these were mainly used with shields one-handed, but you could if you wanted to grip it two-handed, but one of the things that gives is a certain degree of um, sort of counterbalance to the blade. So it's a much more nimble sword, much more nimble for uh, thrusting and more varied uh, blade use, should we say. More, a wider repertoire of, of uh, a wider variety of ways that you can use the blade and techniques and stuff like this. That being said, you don't have the cleaving power of this big cleaving sword and if you are dealing with opponents who might be wearing um, helmets like this and male armour, then perhaps you want a sword which deals out bigger blows. Of course we know that axes were quite popular, certainly by Scandinavians at this period as well. So they were looking at things that could dish out massive blows. Not to say that the Chinese of this period weren't well armoured, because in fact they were, and in fact their helmets are pretty much equivalent of the European helmets, and the Chinese armour comes in various different sorts, but it's essentially a form of uh, multi-plate armour. Uh, male, not so popular. Um, so uh, they still have considerable amounts of armour at this time. Now, Ironically, it might be the fact that they're using a greater number of plates in their armour might mean that they have a preference for the use of the point. And it must be conceded that the Chinese sword has a much more specialised thrusting point that is even double-edged at the tip there. So it could be that this sword is actually despite perhaps what some people think about the Dao, is perhaps even more thrust-centric than we think of it as, and actually that point is very important in armoured fighting. 
possibly. Um, uh, so that's just a theory. But um, the fact of the matter is that for whatever reason, we find, and we don't know, and I'd be interested to hear your theories and ideas, we find that for some reason there is a significant difference in the same period, despite the fact that they had at least tangentially some contact with each other, there is a huge difference between European swords in the Viking era and Chinese swords in the same time period. So from say 700s, 800s uh, into the 900s. But we don't exactly know why, but it's got to be as always to do with the context. But is it to do with the armour? Is it to do with the types of shields they were using? I don't think so. Um, is it to do with the types of armour? The fact that in Europe it was more to do with mail and in China it was perhaps more to do with different types of um, plate armour, almost brigandine-like armours. Um, it could be to do with that. It could be to do with the fact that the Chinese for this, and this is an important point, this was a universal sword for cavalry and infantry. So this was very often used on horseback or on foot, whereas the Vikings famously practically never fought on horseback. They travelled on horseback, but they didn't fight on horseback. They fought in a shield wall. So this perhaps is a specialised shield wall sword. And we have to concede also that while the Franks had a lot of cavalry, certainly the n other Northern European people, the, the um, English and the Irish seem to have presumed, um, and the Scots as well, seem to have predominantly fought also on foot in shield walls. So maybe this is more catered towards shield wall fighting, but then we've got the problem of the Franks and the Longobards who did often fight on horseback with the same swords. Um, so again, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? So, there we go. I think it's fair to say that yes, Chinese swords could have made their way to Northern Europe and the Viking lands at this time. Uh, there's no evidence that they did, but I think it's possible that the, they did and the steel was reused and reformed into the types of swords used in those areas. Why? Why is there such a big difference between, say, Chinese swords and uh, Viking era swords at this time? Why are they so functionally and mechanically different to each other, despite the fact that in terms of shields and, uh, and armour and in terms of fighting on horse or on foot are similar and fighting in large formations are similar, there seem to be lots of common ground and yet they result in a completely different type of weapon. As always, I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts or knowledge. If you've got extra information on uh, this that I can add to this topic and maybe come back with a future update video, I'd be happy to do that as well. Thanks for watching. Give us a like and a subscribe and I'll see you really soon on the channel for another video. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.